but today we will focus on ballot initiatives and whether they're good for democracy. Your moderator today will be um, Professor Charles. He's the Charles Ogletree Jr. Professor of Law and the Faculty Director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice, both here at Harvard. Um, Professor Charles is a brilliant scholar, a wonderful colleague and a beloved teacher by all his students. Um, and you may remember him from hosting earlier in this series. Um, Professor Charles will moderate the discussion today. And after the first 30 minutes or so, we'll be happy to take your questions. If you have a question, please just put them in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to get to all of them. Um, just a reminder that this is being recorded and will later be available on the HLS YouTube channel. Okay, Professor Charles, over to you. Thank you so much, Ruth. And thank you so much for organizing this brilliant set of series. And it is my pleasure um, to share and some of the responsibilities. So as Ruth mentioned, this afternoon, we're gonna be talking about ballot initiatives. Um, in some respects, people like me who write about law and democracy often um, are accused, rightly so, I think, of being too court-centric, uh, focusing on what the Supreme Court will do, uh, and sometimes being too uh, legislative focused as well, focusing on what Congress can do, uh, but ignoring the mechanisms that citizens themselves have to put things on the ballot, um, to change the fundamental rules, to create districting commissions, to affect the process in ways, uh, and, and particularly where they're stymied by either constitutional, uh, the court's refusal to get involved, um, uh, legislative inaction by Congress, or uh, legislative inaction in their particular states. So this afternoon, we're going to be looking at that mechanism of uh, changing and affecting uh, American democracy through the process of ballot initiatives. Changes have been made, for example, in Alaska through ranked choice or Florida or California is a state in which uh, we know the impact that ballot initiatives have had. Uh, Virginia with respect to redistricting, uh, Massachusetts failed ranked choice, um, and Michigan um, as another example. We have three really amazing uh, panelists this afternoon to guide us through this process. I will start by introducing them each in turn, and I'll give very short introductions, uh, starting with Katie Fahey. She's an, an activist who successfully led the grassroots campaign to ban partisan gerrymandering in Michigan. She's the founder of Voters Not Politicians. She organized thousands of volunteers who, who collected um, th hundreds of thousands of voter signatures for Proposal 2, a ballot initiative amending the state constitution to create an independent redistricting commission. Uh, she will talk to us. She now serves as the executive director of The People, a national nonpartisan reform organization. And we're so privileged that she's here to share her uh, insights with us this afternoon. Also, Chris Melody Field Figueredo has led Ballot Initiative Strategy Center as its executive director since June 2018. She brings nearly two decades of experience in advocacy, creative collaborate, and co creative collaborative spaces, movement building, uh, has devoted her career to social, social justice and ensuring that democracy works for we the people. Um, at Ballot Initiative Center, she leads the organization's vision, strategic planning, and fundraising efforts. Uh, she's a person who identifies as a queer woman of color who came to the United States at an early age with working class parents, and she leads from her lived experience and desire to build an equitable and just world. Uh, welcome, Chris. It's a pleasure to have you. And third, Adav Nodi is um, Center for uh, CLC's Vice President and Legal Director, Center for for campaign, well, it used to be the campaign finance center. Adopt, you're, I'm blinking now. You're going to have to uh, 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 correct me on, on the score, which is a bit unfortunate because I was on their board. He directs and manages CLC's strategic litigation and has conducted dozens of constitutional issues in the district courts, court of appeals in the United States and Supreme Court. He also coordinates programmatic activities overseeing uh, efforts to reform the campaign finance system, protect voting rights, ensure fair redistricting, and promote uh, government ethics. So this afternoon, we are privileged to have all three of these folks. They're going to take a few minutes, about five to seven min minutes each, uh, starting with Katie to provide us with a, their sense of um, the types of um, possibilities with uh, initiatives and changing democracy. And then from there, we will 
um, go to, so we'll have some questions for the panel and then we'll go to questions from our audience. Welcome all three. And Katie, if you would like to lead us, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me and what a wonderful panel to be on. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, so I think to share my perspective, I'll share a little bit of my story. I was not an expert in campaign law. Um, I knew that the ballot initiative process existed, but really didn't know much beyond that. And I made a Facebook post one day that said, hey, I want to end gerrymandering in Michigan. If you want to help, let me know. Smiley face. And that somehow led to then amending the Constitution. Um, we learned about the ballot initiative process, learned that in Michigan, if we could write constitutional language, gather a bunch of signatures. In 2018, it was 315,654 registered Michigan voter signatures in 180 days. Then we could ultimately bring this question up to the people of our state to vote on. And if we got about 2 million people to vote yes, then we could actually amend our constitution to have an independent citizen to distribution. And one of the things that I think was the greatest takeaway from that moment of making the Facebook post all the way two years later to actually amending our constitution and getting that vote yes, and then even now into 2022 and finally having that commission in place and seeing their work take action, so that we actually have fair maps again in Michigan, one of the biggest things I saw is that this is such a pure form of direct democracy. The ballot initiative process actually lets us, the people of our country or the people of our state, be able to have a say when our politicians have too much self-interest to actually create a law that benefits the people. Um, one of the things we did even with writing the constitutional language is we went across our entire state. We went to all of our congressional districts at least twice and we held town hall meetings where we talked about what's the status quo of this law what would it look like if we changed it we had thoughtful deliberations about what should the future of our democracy and our representation look like and what started with only three speakers we got standing room only everywhere we went and soon that was thousands of people those thousands of people helped gather those signatures but ultimately was up to the majority of people in our state to actually vote yes and each of those steps was a way for people who normally don't help write constitutional language, normally don't even necessarily vote, to actually get involved and be engaged and have a say over the laws that were impacting them. I think ultimately that's one of the biggest benefits that the ballot initiative process provides us, is it provides an actual option for the people of a state to be able to come together and say enough is enough, we're going to take this into our own hands and make sure that fairness Great, thank you, that's a great start. Chris, please. Thank you so much, Professor Charles and Ruth, longtime friend for inviting me to be on this panel. And I'm so excited to do a panel again at Harvard with Katie. Um, so my name is Chris Melody Fields Figueredo. My pronouns are she, her, ella. I come to you from the Piscataue and Nacotchtank land or Washington, DC. Um, and I am the executive director of the Ballot Initiative Strategy Center. We're a movement building infrastructure organization that uses ballot measures, what we call the people's tool, as a way to build state-based power and strengthen our democracy. So I think you'll know what side I fall on. Um, and you know, Professor Charles, when you talked about, you know, in your opening about, you know, sometimes as lawyers. Uh, you don't think about ballot measures as, as part of the part of a process. You focus a lot on the courts. You know, I'm thinking right now of what is facing us at the Supreme Court right now, specifically with Roe versus Wade, um, and what could potentially happen of overturning decades of law about um, access to abortion. One of the things that actually in Michigan is happening right now, rather than wait for the Supreme Court decision. There's folks on the ground that are proactively putting forth a, a, an amendment to the Michigan State Constitution to guarantee the right to access of an abortion. And I think that really speaks to what is so beautiful about um, ballot measures. It's really our tool. It allows us to be agents in democracy. And I think if you think about what we've seen over the last several decades, um, it, I don't think it's whether there's an appetite, it's that people don't see themselves reflected in our democracy. And that doesn't just mean representative to our representation. 
in, in government. It's really about them feeling, for us feeling that we have self-determination to decide what happens for our community. And, you know, what happened with um, Katie in Michigan, you know, going to the actual people and asking them, what does this look like? That's what we believe is so central of actually creating a thriving democracy and a valid initiative process is not developing policy in New York or DC or whatever institution, but actually asking the people who are gonna be impacted most about what would actually this change mean to your community and how do we together craft language to make that happen. Thought measures themselves are an experiment. They are a reimagination of our democracy. 120 years ago, right, out of the railroad barons in California who had complete control over state legislatures, it was an opportunity to put power back into the hands of the people. And now you fast forward to today, and there are big challenges, right? The corporatization of ballot measures is real, especially if you're in California. The legal language, um, and the challenges around ballot measures, those are huge obstacles. And Katie knows that, uh, you know, for, um, in, in Michigan, right? Getting the right language and the way these laws were written uh, makes it really hard and difficult. So it's not like we're just doing this everywhere and all the time. The, you know, the other challenges are there, it requires a lot to get something onto the ballot, right? It's tons of signatures on the ground, going into communities, right, to actually qualify, and that doesn't even guarantee qualification, right? And then only half of the country, plus DC, actually have some form of the citizen-initiated process. So that, that, it means it's incomplete, right? Those are all challenges that we face when we, we think about ballot measures. But I really want all of us to imagine what we need right now. What's working? What's not working? And I think we can all agree what works for, what's happening right now from what happened with the filibuster a couple of weeks ago, what has happened at the federal government, what is currently happening at st state legislatures, people don't feel like they have power even if they have the right to vote. And let's also be very clear, this has always been a rigged system in our democracy. For a queer woman of color who's an immigrant, I wasn't included in the original in the conception of our democracy, right? So we've always been working with the rigged system. And I believe that ballot measures provide us an avenue to reimagine what democracy looks like, to reimagine and engage voters who've never seen themselves as a part of our democracy. And I'm really looking forward to talking to all of you about what we can do with our imaginations. Perfect. Adav Nodi from the Campaign Legal Center. I kept the old name kept popping into my brain and I couldn't get it out. Uh, Adav. Thanks, thanks, Professor Charles. Thanks to Professor Greenwood for uh, the opportunity to be here today and, and to my fantastic co-panelists. I, I guess I'm gonna pick off um, from where Chris left off there. You know, Ballot measures are, you know, they're a means to an end, right? They're a tool. And like any tool, they can be used for good or they could be used for bad. They could be used to make the world a better place or, or, or a worse place. And, you know, my, my co-panelists and, and Campaign Legal Center, um, where I work, have had a, a great deal of success um, in, in recent years using that tool of ballot measures for good in the specific context of democracy. But I, I guess I want to raise sort of a, a practical concern about the long-term viability of, of the use of ballot measures or the use of direct democracy to advance representative democracy um, within a you know within a state or or in an area. Um, you know, I think the the defining fight of the democracy of our time is money versus people. Right, it's it's ultra wealthy entities, mostly corporations, trying to control or co-opt or or capture, uh, you know, our our system of government to the detriment of the actual people, right? The actual individual human beings um, who who comprise the the country. And the the challenge in or one of the challenges, um, and I, I think probably the biggest one in the context of ballot measures is that 
Um, so 40 years ago uh, in uh, First National Bank of Boston versus Bilotti, the Supreme Court ruled that corporations have a First Amendment right to spend as much money as they want in the context of ballot measures. Unlike, say, candidate elections where corporations can be limited from making contributions to candidates because of the, the potential to corrupt the candidate if, if the corporation were to give uh, enough money, um, the Supreme Court said, well, a, a ballot measure can't, it's not a person, it can't be corrupted, or you can't buy a favor from a ballot measure. So that rationale, the anti-corruption rationale doesn't apply. Um, and so it's, it's uh, corporations can spend as much as they want on, on ballot measures. Uh, and no matter what you think of that decision, and I, I mean, personally, I think it's you know, as, as wrong <laughs> as a decision can be, it, it's not changing. It's been on the books for a long time. It's not changing anytime soon. And that whole body of jurisprudence is not changing anytime soon. So even though you know, pro-democracy ballot measures have had a pretty good run um, recently, I, I think realistically, the long-term prognosis is not great. Right. We have just just given the, the system in which we're operating, we have increasing concentration of wealth in a smaller and smaller number of massive corporate entities. And the coupled with the, the jurisprudential trends we're seeing from, from the Supreme Court, I really would not count on being able to hold off corporate capture of of ballot measures indefinitely. We, we have won some battles, some really important battles. My co-panelists have won some of the biggest. Um, it, it, but in the long run, I'm really not sure this is, this is a war we can win. And we need to be realistic and clear-eyed about the prospects of, of being able to continue to enhance representative democracy through direct democracy when the whole mechanism is structured in a way that advantages in a very fundamental way, moneyed interests over individual um, individual voters. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I think there there are other um, there are other ways in which the direct democracy process could could lend itself to um, corporate manipulation besides money. But I'll, I'll stop there. All right, great. I was planning on asking um, you all some questions, but we have some amazing questions from our audience. And so I'm just gonna start there. Please keep them coming. We're gonna to try to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, and many of them actually you all have already anticipated. And so I think this will continue the conversation. But let's just start with the first question that we received uh, from Peter Enrich. Enrich, which is, as Derek Bell carefully noted, the ballot initiative process, despite its democratic and quote virtues, also opens the door to discrimination against marginalized groups that are more constrained than in the ordinary legislative process. So how do these concerns temper your enthusiasm for the initiative process and how can those concerns be addressed? And I, I will like pair that, that question with some others that point specifically to California and particular the three strikes you're out um, uh, measures in California. Uh, James uh, raises, uh, uh, Jim raises that question in particular about California, the initiative process, and how, again, that has been um, bad for specifically marginalized communities. Now, this picks up on a Dobbs point, uh, but I'd like for uh, us as a panelist to, to also think about the historical context. And I'll get to the, the particular point that you've made, Adab, in terms of going to the future, the role of money in the process, we'll come to that in a moment. But what about the fact that uh, this is a process that in some respects has not led to good results for people of color or for marginalized people? Um, how do you all think about the utility of that tool? And anybody can can feel free to jump in, Chris. Since you're nodding, if you wouldn't mind, um, I would. I'll, I can start with you. Sure. I mean, I'm I'm not going to say this is a perfect tool. It's imperfect, like everything in our democracy, right? Tell me what guarantee we have with any of the candidates that are elected to represent us. What guarantee do we have that what they say on the campaign trail is actually going to translate to legislation? And I think that's the experiment of democracy, right? of us working together to legislate 
to determine what power looks like. And I, so I, I start there is there's no guarantee for it anyway, our democracy. Um, whether it's representative government, whether it's ballot measures, whether it's the courts, there is no guarantee that it's going to turn out the exact way that we want it to. And that's the experiment that we're all in, right? I agree. In California, ballot measures have been completely corporatized and they have, they're not <laughs> in many ways um, actually creating really good results for, um, for folks in California. You know, we believe at BIS about a long-term strategy, right? So we think about the entire 360 life cycle of a ballot measure and each lever, lever of power that it touches, whether it's the courts, whether it's legislation, whether it's the people themselves. We think about the th full life cycle from incubation, idea to whether we decide to go forward to how we qualify to the ballot, to the campaign itself. And what's even increasingly more important now is post-election implementation. We think about all of that, the courts, the legislature, how that interacts with ballot measures to really build a long-term strategy of what makes sense to happen right now. And that means the political conditions that are, um, hap are happening in a state, whether a state has really hostile state legislature and preemption, and preemption comes in, into play to how, what is happening now, and California is a very good example of corporations using it. Prop 22 is a good, is a, is a clear example, right? Where the app, the gig, the gig, the gig economy has used ballot measures to reclassify workers, right? So we know all that exists. And we also have this challenge that many of these laws were created 120 years ago when America looked very differently. And let's also be very honest, when ballot measures themselves were created, they were purposely prevented in former slaveholding states because legislator, leg, legislatures did not want Black people to have the ability to have power to change law. So that's real. So if this is the conundrum that we are in, right? I think it requires all of us, whatever position we are in, whether you're a lawyer, where you're a grassroots organizer, where you're a, person, a policy person in a think tank, for all of us to come together and think about what needs to change and what are we building on the ground? What is the infrastructure in those states, courts, all those things, how they work together to make a representative democracy, an inclusive democracy. And ballot measures are one means for us to do it. This is wonderful, Chris. Uh, Katie, let me ask you to think through a similar theme, but within the context of very, a very, of a very specific question, uh, which is the given that elections, the elections in which ballot measures tend to land are off year elections with electorates that are less representative relative to registered voters, how concerned should we be that ballot measures are actually much less representative of the uh, public opinion as a whole? And how did you think about that question and the context of um, the specifics of your of the particular campaign and that, that you led? I think it does come a lot it comes down to a lot of the actual organizing and who's doing that organizing and how thoughtful are they being about it. If you look especially at local ballot initiatives, like things being passed at the city, if you can actually turn out voters who care about that issue, they can completely sway the election. It might be going one way, but then surprise, you actually invested in communities who normally don't go out and vote during that election. And they did show up because you took the time and energy um, and the creativity to go out and reach out. So, kind of similar to what Chris was saying, like this is a tool where we actually have a chance to be able to make change and how we go about organizing that is, is one of the really great unique opportunities. Now, some states have some specific laws in them, like you have to gather signatures as an example from like a certain percentage of the counties in the actual state, which maybe lands to some geographic diversity. And I think you can maybe look at some of those to tweak them to make it more inclusive, but one of the things that I've seen is a lot of, you know, even if it's a grassroots started campaign, like our campaign still took $17 million to pass. Like there's a ton of money being spent in ballot initiatives either way. 
And I think that a lot of those funders are taking a big responsibility as well as the people who are wanting to organize them to try and think about how do we be more representative? How do we make sure that from the very beginning we are crafting language here where we're actually from in different communities that have been marginalized and make sure their voices are at the table instead of just taking these cookie cutter pieces. And it doesn't make it illegal to still take a cookie cutter uh, piece of legislation and try and pass it through. But the other thing that at least we're seeing in Michigan is now that we've kind of broken the mold on how campaigns are normally done. Traditionally, they were just corporate interests spending a bunch of money. They've already got their language written. They're passing it through. Well, our campaign actually trained the folks in our media to ask more questions, to dig into who is behind this issue. Where are they getting their funding? Like starting to like generate maps of like every single small dollar donation and where are those different communities? What does that look like? I think that also starts to then put more pressure on campaigns to actually have to answer to those questions. And then the public can ultimately decide, do they still want this to happen or to not? Um, you know, for us, one of the, we, we were in 2018, so it wasn't a presidential year. So yes, there's traditionally a, a, a less of a high turnout. And then um, in, traditionally that would have more of like, I guess a Republican, uh, folks turning out, although in 2018, it was the blue wave. And so there were definitely more Democrats, but that also made it really intentional for us. I mean, when you're putting something in the constitution, you have to be thinking nonpartisan because if you're just thinking partisan, you're thinking so short term, what are the parties gonna look like in 30 years and 40 years and 50 years? If you're putting that in the constitution today, then those impacts are gonna have ripple in, uh, ripple effects. And so we, from the very beginning, were really trying to be inclusive with our outreach and figuring out how do we invite folks to the table um, to realize that this is better for all Michiganders, regardless of who you vote for, because it's a more fair, just law that reflects the community. And I think, again, it comes down to organizing, make sure that that's being thought of. This is great. Dav, um, so I want to follow up on something that Katie mentioned, which leads to this question. What real, is there anything really wrong with money and the initiative process? Like we could see what the problem with is money in the legislative process because it is changing outcomes and buying votes. But if what we're doing is we're, you know, there's a particular specific initiative on the ballot. Um, and there's good money, you know, there's bad money that's coming in, meaning that, that the, pol the substantive policy is bad, but then there's a lot of money to, to put forth a substantively good policy. Um, so is there really something wrong with your know, money itself as a part from the substance of the policy with respect to the initiative? Because you actually know precisely what it is that you're getting, unlike the legislative process. Yeah, I, I think there is something problematic about money, uniquely problematic about money in the ballot initiative process. And, and I think it manifests in two ways. One, um, which is um, maybe maybe just an accident of the way the law is structured right now, um, but maybe not, is that um, entities that are not allowed to participate at all in our, any other election in the entire United States, federal, state, or local, are allowed to spend unlimited amounts of money on ballot measures. Um, there was recently a ballot measure in Maine where a Canadian uh, power company spent millions and millions of dollars uh, on, on the ballot measure. That company wouldn't be allowed to spend one cent in a candidate election. It really has no business trying to influence the people of Maine. Um, and, yet, and yet it's permitted. And so I think there, there are ways in which the money coming into uh, ballot measures we have recognized in other contexts is inherently problematic, and yet it, it is coming in through that avenue. The other, though, which I think is, is more generally applicable, is that you know in candidate elections, what, what a voter is doing right, is, is assessing a person. Right? They're assessing people. And that's something we all know how to do. We all do it you know, all, all day long. Um, and they're not parsing out, we, I mean, we know voters don't parse out like here are the thousand positions this candidate is going to take if they're elected. And I agree with 600 and disagree with 400. So I'm going to vote for them. That's, that's not how it works. Like they're assessing the person. But for a ballot measure, it's not like that. You have one vote. It's all or nothing. You either support this or, or you vote against it. And because the vast majority of voters don't read legislative language, understandably, right? And, and it's not realistic to ask. 
there is more of an opportunity for money to shape the perception of the voter as to what it is they're voting on than possibly there is for candidate elections, at least higher profile ones. So I think the effects play out differently potentially with ballot measures than they do, you know, of spending play out differently with ballot measures than they do with candidate elections. Great. So let's shift a little bit to uh, some other sets of questions. So here's someone who's asking, one of our participants who's asking uh, for some help and support. So the question is specific to Missouri and which um, they've, you, actors have used ballot, uh, the initiative as a policy for years. Um, where it takes 300,000 signatures to qualify for uh, to qualify for an amendment, uh, but that is now at risk because the legislature wants to make it almost impossible, increasing the signature requirement by 200,000 more signatures and by requiring two thirds of vote at the polls uh, versus what is currently a simple majority. And the question is whether there are any uh, advice or str strategic support, um, et cetera, thoughts that, that our panel lists have for preserving um, measures and initiatives in places like Missouri in which uh, legislatures are trying to make it a little bit ha much harder to exercise. Oh, Missouri, I think 17 or 19 bills have already been introduced one month into the state legislature to undermine the ballot measure process. Um, <laughs> yes, um, and actually this last year. Um, so one of the interesting things, right, in 20, a couple of years ago, um, actually after the 2010 election cycle when um, progressives lost everywhere and the Citizen United case came down, like, right, it's like, it was like one of our, one of many red flags we've had over the last several years of our democracy. BISC worked with folks on the ground, national organizations, funders, to create a proactive strategy to actually bring progressive pro proactive issues to the ballot. For in 2016, four minimum wage ballot measures. One. Then in 2018, when um, Katie um, and many other states um, passed uh, amendment, uh, well, uh, redistricting voting access amendment four, and um, in Florida, which restored voting rights to formerly incarcerated, abolition of slavery as a form of punishment, um, increased funding to public education, right? And another swath of um, um, measures passed. Before that, there were minimal attacks to the ballot measure process. As we started winning on these progressive issues, those attacks started happening. And Missouri is one of those states where the state legislature has just been like, trying to undo the process. And not only doing the process itself, in 2020 when Medicaid expansion uh, passed in Missouri, the state legislatures refused to implement it, even though the court has told them that they have to um, implement. So this is a particular challenge that we have right now. We're actually working with a number of groups on the ground in um, Missouri, both inside the dome and outside of the dome, um, job, like Jobs with Justice in uh, Missouri, Missouri Wins, uh, uh, Move. There's a number of groups that we're working with in the state to actually um, fight back um, in <clears throat> these legislative attacks. And fighting back is not enough. We actually have to strengthen and improve of the laws in a number of these states to a lot of what Adib um, has already mentioned, you know, there, there, there's big risks and challenges that we have to fix and we have to use the law um, um, to fit, uh, to, to address those, those holes um, that, you know, um, <clears throat> open the door for, for not great things happening. So, you know, it's not just Missouri, it's happening in Florida, it's happening in Arizona. There are gonna be ballots, uh, actually ballot measures to undo ballot measures in South Dakota and Arizona, um, Arkansas. And so my question is, just as the people have begun to use this tool to wield power for themselves, now we're seeing our representatives in state government try to undo this, right? And I think that's why it's so important that we're not just looking at the tool by itself, but it has to be a part of our legislative thinking as well, our legal strategy as well. That's, that's been the problem I would say for the 120 years that this tool has existed is it's been in existence in isolation 
of the other levers of power. And I think that is really a choice point we have moving forward. Adav, what, what do you think about the use of initiatives as a way to follow up on Chris's point of checking legislative power and perhaps backlash against it as a reaction to its success and checking legislative power? Right, I, this, this is the, the dynamic I think we're seeing everywhere, right? That the more that direct democracy is used to cabin or remove the power of entrenched legislators, the more there is a backlash. And I think the question, you know, those of us in the democracy area need to be asking is, where do we want to be fighting that fight? Do we want to be fighting it on the, on the grounds of what should direct democracy look like, or should we be fighting it um, in the context of why do we have state legislators who are willing to seemingly uh, 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 take power away from their own people and overrule things that their own people have voted for? What is it about the mechanism of representative democracy that has created that dynamic and allowed it to flourish without repercussions for those elected officials? And you know, we could we could here run through a whole laundry list of ballot measures that have been either explicitly or effectively. Uh, gutted by state legislatures, right? In theory, they should have paid a, a serious price for that, but they didn't, right? So, so what is it about the system that's that's enabling that, and is the is the fix through the excuse me through the direct democracy process or through the representative democracy process or both? Thank you, Katie. I have a particular question uh, for you about training. Uh, experienced lawyers uh, to draft um, direct democracy measures, to what extent, how much of that is being done, uh, given the fact that one of the worries is inartfully crafted uh, ballot items. And you touched on that in some of your comments earlier, and I wonder if you might elaborate on the training aspect, its necessity, uh, its effectiveness, and how it's being done. Sure. Yeah, I think I understand the question. Um, so at least for us, uh, one of the exciting things that the people, that's the organization I run now, is working on is actually a project called deliberations.us. Um, and that's a way to actually gather mass feedback from people on a specific topic um, and the different complexities of that topic. So what we did for redistricting is we broke it down into three main sections of how the law would be changed who draws the lines, what's the criteria for the lines being drawn, and then what should the overall process actually look like? And those are the three things that we went and we asked people about and asked their preferences and really tried to dig into the issues around so that we could get feedback that could actually be used in crafting policy. Now, when we were first talking to more traditional constitutional lawyers, they were kind of like, what? Like you're inviting thousands of people to have a say in what is going to be in the Constitution. I think they were a little cringy about it. They're like, okay, this is not how it normally goes. We are the experts, but let's let's uh, let's figure this out. But we broke it down to reflect, I think, like a normal law process, like the research we needed to do for what are other um, what are other states best practices, like all the case law that's been done both in Michigan and outside of Michigan that could impact this. And we showed that, yes, a veterinarian or a birthing doula or a stay-at-home dad can actually help contribute to this research and when we're actually invited into the process when we open that up. Um, and so we really used it as a, a mixed approach, I guess, where we had lawyers who were really doing the actual crafting of the constitutional language, but for informing those different decision points, because there were plenty of decisions for how the law was specifically crafted, that's where we use still those best practices, looking at what was going to stand up in court, but also listening to the people of Michigan and being able to listen to what they're saying and, and, and incorporate that. So like, as an example for redistricting, who draws the lines, we were hearing over and over again, we want a body of people that actually look like the people of Michigan. So we have this kind of unique lottery system that's a weighted lottery to make sure that race and gender and education level and income level are all incorporated into who these 13 people are so that they hopefully actually reflect 
a little bit of what the actual population of Michigan looked like. And we would have never, that was not anything a normal lawyer just looking at the existing examples would have come up with on their own. It really was kind of this beautiful reflection of how do we make sure that we're re reflecting that piece. Um, and uh, and it's still been a struggle, I think, as we continue to even talk about the next issues and making sure that we're keeping the door open for, you know, not make, I, I think it's all about proving that listening to everyday people isn't a waste of time. Um, it first of all motivates people a lot to actually be included in a process, but it also creates better laws. Our law actually stood up in court when many thought that it wouldn't, and it still has continued to stand up to legal challenges. And again, some of those innovations came because of people who aren't normally constitutional experts in their state. Very so, so one, Chris, please. One thing I'll add is, so I'm an organizer, right? But I used to work for the Lawyers Committee of Civil Rights Under Law, right? So I know how lawyers think too, right? Um, and one of the things that we've been working on um, at FIS is called the Lawyers Guild, where we're actually inviting attorneys from across the country, some who are like longtime bout measure legal practitioners, you know, those who are, are um, you know, <clears throat> other attorneys who are, are may have another practice, but um, are, are curious about this um, to actually work with us on model policy, model language, what are the challenges, what are briefs that have previously happened, what have been particular challenges um, to the crafting of language, what hasn't upheld in court, what is up being upheld in court. So we're currently working um, with what we call our Lawyers Guild of Attorneys all across the country. So I, that's an invitation to any lawyers who would want to be a part of that and actually um, in particular, um, I don't know if y'all have had Pervy Shaw from the movement um, uh, Law Lab as a speaker, so brilliant, um, but really working with lawyers to take a movement lawyering approach, um, which may not always <laughs> be natural, um, uh, certainly not how you're taught in law school in many times, but really what is the relationship between the, you know, for, between the legal community and the organizers on the ground of working together um, to uh, to work on ballot initiatives and, and, other, and other policy pieces too. Hmm. Wonderful. So there are a couple of questions I'd like to pair together. One question is um, the deference that courts ought, ought to give or not to give to a ballot initiative. So should courts defer when those are challenged, should they defer more, less, the same compared to say a legislative action that would be challenged and the courts? And then the second question is whether um, there ought to be some things that are off limits to initiatives and, and referenda. Uh, Adam, if you wouldn't mind um, starting us off on, on either one of those questions. Yeah, happy to, and I, I think I can answer them with the same answer, which is there, there is at least one subject that should be off limits, and that is restricting the franchise. It, it should not be permissible to use direct democracy to limit democracy, um, and uh, courts should be um, deeply skeptical of any effort to uh, cut back who can vote through public, you know, through 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 majority vote um, at the at the ballot box. I happy to talk more about why that is, but I, I think that's a that's a that's a fairly bright line we could draw. Katie or Chris, do either of you want to get in on on this as well? I mean, it's an interesting question, and I think. What what we're seeing now, um, in particular, how some ballot measures are being crafted and what's actually getting thrown out in court. So, uh, for example, in um, which, which was not necessarily visible um, to voters um, when. I'm speaking specifically to Prop 22 in California, the gig worker ballot measure that would have, that uh, tried to create a, a subclass of um, of uh, workers. Um, one of the pieces that was part of that 
So on its face, right, this was about, you know, sorry, I'm trying to like not <laughs> be um, to um, what's the word about uh, my, my own view uh, in this. But one of the reasons it got struck down is sub in the, in the, the initiative, it would have required a seven eighths majority to overturn or make any changes to Prop 22, which the court was like, where's legislative, like, <laughs> where's the legislative power or authority to make any changes to the law if you're having that, that that's like a super majority. Um, and so, and I, I think I use as a, an example of really thinking carefully about how these are crafted and what may or may not up, uh, uh, what might um, hurt the ears of a particular judge, right? Who is, cares about what con state constitutions say would be in integrity of state constitutions and the integrity of the law and how we craft um, the language for these in initiatives. So the, your point raises a, it ties into a, a couple sets of questions, which are whether um, ballot initiatives, the process of ballot initiatives can be entrenched by a ballot initiative itself, right? That is, um, to what extent should one counter against legislate, legislative undermining of the ballot initiative process is to um, allow the ballot initiatives to be self-entrenching, that the process itself should say, okay, you're going to require a supermajority constitutional mechanism to undo that process. So there's the entrenchment of the process, and then there might also be entrenchment of specific initiatives, right? And one might think about those two things differently, um, but I wonder if you all have views on those questions. There are two types of questions that we've received in the chat. I wonder if you might have views on those questions, um, entrenching the process or entrenching particular substantive uh, initiatives uh, from legislative uh, undermining or even undermining by, by the initiative itself. Katie, you want to start us off and then maybe sure. go Sure, I can, I can go back to sharing a story from Michigan, I think. Um, so one of the lawsuits that was brought against us while we were actually, we had already gathered our signatures. We were like a year and a half in. You know, at this point, we had like 14,000 individual donors, which is 33 times more than any other ballot initiative in the state. We had reached over half a million people and we just wanted to be on the ballot and let the people of Michigan vote. And basically, I, I was more, you know, not worded like this, but the argument against us was that redistricting is too confusing and complicated for the people to be trusted to vote on it. And that's why they were trying to let us not actually let the people of Michigan um, vote on this, which was just, it just as a citizen who, again, wasn't a lawyer, didn't have any of this background, had just had to figure out how to get through all these hurdles, because there were so many hurdles to actually navigating the political process, and then to like, kind of get this slap on the face of like, oh, so you think we're too dumb to actually be able to vote on something that is at the crux of the basis of our democracy, like what our representation actually looks like and our ability to actually get accountability in our government. When, especially in our instance, we had literally gone across that we, this law had more input from the people of Michigan than I think any other law had in the previous decade. I mean, we heard from people consistently that they had never even seen the candidate who runs for office visit their town, let alone us who are visiting every single month, make sure that the people there were updated and could have an actual say in what this process was. And so I think all of that to say, I really do think that the law, the ability to use this process should be kept pretty broad and protected for that actual intent of if, if, all the requirements are met for being able to bring that ballot initiative to the people, let the people be that fail safe. Let the people who are voting it be on that fail safe. Now, that being said, I do think this is where money comes back into play because for example, again, in Michigan, you know, we were two weeks out and our opposition out of nowhere from one donor dropped $6 million on all ads that we actually got some of them removed because they were just lying about what the ballot initiative was. 
And redistricting was an issue that still the majority of people in Michigan probably didn't know a lot about. And so that one commercial could really sway how they ended up voting on this. So, I mean, I think this is all with like a big asterisk on it, but at the same time, direct democracy is one of the only options that actually got us accountability in Michigan. Like we now for the first time in over 40 years actually have competitive, potentially moderate seats coming back to us. And they wouldn't have whether the Democrats or Republicans were in power because they would want to keep manipulating the system to benefit themselves. And so I think that's what informs my opinion. Thank you. Adav. Yeah, I mean, for, for anybody who works on a ballot measure, right, your worst nightmare is that you, you go through, you get the language, you get the signatures, you get on the ballot, you win, and then the legislature's like, yeah, no. <laughs> uh, right? It's and and that happens. And um, so there's a real, uh, you know, you, you give real thought in, in crafting these two. Is there, is there an entrenchment mechanism? Is there a way to prevent that? Um, I, but in, entrenching a ballot measure like a ballot measure itself is just a tool and it can be used for good or for, for ill. Um, and, you know, I think we have to be conscious that, that the entrenchment mechanisms that we develop for the ballot measures we like can also be used for ballot measures we don't like. And there needs to be um, a balance struck. I mean, maybe this is obvious, but there needs to be a balance between, you know, ensuring that if there are going to be ballot measures, they mean something, right? And they're not just immediately removed uh, versus uh, giving them some sort of super codified status that could, you know, in entrenched measures that are, are deeply problematic, either democratically or otherwise. Perfect. Okay, so here's our last set of questions. And Chris, if you wouldn't mind, I would I would love to start with you. All right. So the two part two part question. The first part is, um, what is the ballot measure that you think has been the most effective, uh, and that you would point to as an example? of um, what we can achieve for our democracy. So I'll just ask you, ask you all to pick, each of you to pick one, um, although Katie, that might be cheating, but nevertheless, all right, just pick, pick, <laughs> pick one. Um, the second part is the limit of, of um, initiatives. Uh, and this is the question that, that someone asked, look, really shouldn't we be looking for ways that generating broad consensus um, and really as opposed to using uh, the initiative, which, which uh, this questioner views as, as the tools of the activists on the wings of a particular set of issue, right? So, um, you know, is it the initiative really a second best option? And shouldn't we be looking at, um, at other mechanisms of generating consensus? And we'll take this as each of your parting shots for our panel. Sure, and I am gonna to have to drop off right out of this because my daughter is auditioning for her, the Magnet High School, um, Arts High School, and I gotta take her to her audition. Um, so I'll start with the last piece real quick. Um, um, actually, I, I'm gonna, one of the ones I think, and normally I would say Amendment 4 in Florida, um, and I know Desmond Mead um, has spoken um, a number of times, and I, I know Katie knows him well, and, and I think Adab too, but I'm actually going to name a ballot measure that lost last year. Yes on two in Minneapolis, which would have been the first of its kind ballot measure to create um, a Department of Public Safety. Um, this is in the wake of the murder of George Floyd um, that <clears throat> led to the racial uprisings in 2010. Um, and it was the first time a measure of its kind wasn't just thinking about policing and, and it was about what actually safety means for communities. It lost. But 60,000 folks in Minneapolis voted yes. At the same time, they also voted on rent control. Um, and for me, that is a, a, a sig that signifies the possibility for us to build consensus, to have a conversation with communities about something that doesn't exist yet. Um, 
And that I think is such a clear example. And even though they lost, black organizing increased in that state, right, in, in Minneapolis. Groups had never been able to engage previously were part of it. They learned so much um, from that. And, and, they're, and they're opening a door to what could be possible in other places. And they also really had some really hard conversations too with their city council members and who would have ultimately had to, to implement that. Um, and for me, that the failure is just as important as winning something. What do we lose from that? And what are we actually building? Winning isn't enough. That's not how we build power. But, if we truly engage folks at every level, then we start to shift and begin to imagine something that doesn't exist. Um, and I forgot what else I was gonna say because I just I love, I just truly believe in what had had the door that has been opened for Minneapolis and what I think, what I know we are committed to at BISC is continuing that conversation of reimagination of public safety because we all know that police are not keeping us safe, and many, especially black and brown folks. Thank you so much, Chris. Let me just thank you for uh, wonderful participation on this panel. Uh, Adav, and then we'll close out with you, Katie. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, oh, in terms of the, the top ballot measures, um, uh, I would also um, uh, point to uh, the re Franchisement ballot measure that passed with a supermajority in Florida, um, which was a, a real national model, and Katie's ballot measure, which you know did more to change the the structural dynamics within a state than you know any other measure that we've seen in a long time. Um, you know, I think the limits are mostly along the lines of what we discussed earlier. I mean, all the flaws in our representative democracy manifest in our direct democracy too, right? To the extent it's hard for, you know, some folks to cast ballots and have those ballots counted, that's true for, you know, candidate elections and, and ballot measures. Um, the the off-year election problem um, that, a, that a questioner asked about earlier is very real, and I'm concerned about the increasing use of um, ballot measures to try to drive uh, drive folks to the polls through not entirely um, <laughs> uh, altruistic motives to get them to vote in candidate elections. We saw some of that with like ballot measures that would ban uh, non-citizen voting in a state. Right? That's not a thing um, that actually needed to be enacted by ballot measure, um, and yet we saw a pop on, on ballot measures so that you know, there could be advertising saying go into the polls and you know stop non-citizens from voting. That is not, that's not a positive development for our democracy. And then um, finally, going back to, to the beginning of our conversation, I do think money uh, plays out in a different way in ballot measures than it does necessarily in candidate elections in a way that um, should give us pause about how we're going to counter that going forward. Great, Katie, you have the last word. Sure. Um, as far as the best example of a ballot initiative, I actually, I think that now that I've expanded beyond Michigan and been able to talk to folks trying to pass ballot initiatives across the country, um, the one thing I see that all Americans have in common is that we are so frustrated with the government and the status quo. And we might blame different parties or we might blame different policies, but like universally there's common ground that nobody's happy. And I think the ballot initiative process in general offers the opportunity to actually try and do something about it when you reach that breaking point. Um, some of us found this and we had the opportunity to use this process. Other people, when they reach that breaking point might try and storm the Capitol. And that's, I think, just an important piece to keep in mind that like when we are so unhappy and when the government's consistently not delivering results that make us feel like we're actually being heard and represented yet, one of our founding principles in America is that our government is supposed to derive its power from us, the governed, um, that that we are going to try and figure out a way to fix that. And so, you know, I'm most familiar with other folks who have ran in 2018 too. And so, you know, in North Dakota uh, or South Dakota, there were two grandmas, the badass grandmas they started. One was Democrat, one was Republican, having a conversation about how they wanted actual 
accountability in the government and they wanted an ethics uh, reform group. You have Desmond Mead, who after finally serving his time in jail wanted to be able to actually go out and vote because he had changed his life in so many other ways and yet he couldn't vote. For me, we had the Flint water crisis happen in Michigan and our gov and the people of Michigan actually tried to prevent that. And yet our government overturned us trying to um, get rid of a law that they then reinstated and just showing no regard for the people of Michigan to let us actually be a part of our processes. And so I think all of the ballot initiatives that do have their start from kind of that breaking point of, look, I could be doing anything else right now, but I have to fight for our democracy. Those are my favorite. So I, I kind of cheated. That wasn't. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, <laughs> and for looking for the alternatives, you know, I think I think unfortunately where we're at right now, like we definitely need more change. It should not require people to dedicate all of their time, energy and money for years or even decades at a time to try and pass something that our tax dollars go to pay our elected officials to do. The amazing things about seeing the things that do pass at the ballot initiative process is they're with 50, 60, 70% support. And when you already had that much support and these aren't brand, these aren't always brand, new ideas. I think uh, Chris's example is a great one, but, you know, redistricting, there had been over 14 laws introduced over several decades attempting to fix it, yet they were always um, only coming from one party, depending on what party was gerrymandering, the other one was trying to pass reform. The people clearly wanted this. With a Facebook post, we got, you know, thousands of volunteers overnight. And so there is something broken when our elected officials can continue to be elected and yet they can clearly ignore the will of the people and what we actually want. But to actually start fixing that, I think at least in Michigan, we found that by actually using the ballot initiative process to start changing those incentives in our political process, hopefully in the future, we can start getting laws that are passed that are actually reflective of our will. But until then, I think you need absolutely both tools, but hopefully you don't have to always go to the ballot initiative process. I think you should be saved the rare instances when you aren't getting accountability. This was great. You all were absolutely brilliant, wonderful, insightful. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to all of our uh, uh, audience members. And thank you, Professor Greenwood, for organizing this series. Take care and be well and see you the next time.